Often forgotten in the pantheon of those tragic events on September 11, 2001, is the attack on the Pentagon, in which, if you believe the official story, American Airlines Flight 77 was hijacked and flown into the side of the United States Department of Defense. However, there are conspiracy theorists out there who point to the impact holes in the Pentagon's structure, which were much smaller than a standard commercial airliner, positing instead that the Department of Defense's headquarters was actually subject to a missile attack. Further questions have been raised as to why the plane was not shot down as it approached, and why it was not detected by the Pentagon's high-tech missile detection systems. In fact, prior knowledge of the attack sits at the forefront of many 9-11 conspiracy theories. Some believe that the government agencies such as the CIA were warning various interested parties of the attacks in advance of them happening. Immediately prior to the attacks, there are a huge number of put options, where a trader bets that the price of a stock will drop on United Airlines, American Airlines, and many of the organizations with tenancies inside the World Trade Center in New York. VIPs were also warned off taking to the skies on September 11th. Former San Francisco Mayor Willie Brown received a phone call warning him that Americans should be careful about flying on that day. Vague as you like, but it showed clear knowledge that something catastrophic might be about to happen. Having said that, you have warnings like this all the time, and most of the time, they're nothing to worry about. Another important player in the 9-11 truther movement is property developer Larry Silverstein. He bought the lease on the World Trade Center six months prior to the attacks, and many believe he stood to make a tidy profit if anything were to happen to the buildings. After raving in the press that there was a huge profit potential in the buildings, insiders began to raise doubts about their worth, suggesting they may actually come with huge upgrade costs. Riddled with asbestos and in desperate need of refreshing, figures up to $200 million were being pushed around. In the aftermath of their destruction, Silverstein's insurance payout totaled around $7.1 billion, making him a bit of a suspect to conspiracy theorists. One conspiracy theory suggests another possible culprit for the events of 9-11. Quite apart from the radical Islamic Al-Qaeda, there are people out there, believe it or not, that think the Israeli government planned it. Motives for this include incentivizing the United States to attack enemies of Israel or to divert the world's attention from their treatment of Palestinians. Different theories include different motives and different responsible parties. Some point the finger at Mossad, the Israeli security services. Others point the finger at the government of Israel or even Ariel Sharon himself. Some point to Jewish employees being forewarned to skip work by Mossad agents. Some conspiracy sites even suggest that around 4,000 Jewish people didn't turn up to work that day. 400 people subsequently died in those attacks though, which leads me to think that maybe they weren't very good at sending the emails around if this is true, which it's probably not. However, it has to be pointed out that many organizations, including the Anti-Defamation League, point to this theory as just being anti-Semitic, which it just seems like it is. Sorry guys, that's just, you're just being very, very nasty there. A documentary made in the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, Loose Change, made the grand assertion that all of the hijackers who purportedly died in the planes that they took were in fact alive and well and living across the Arab world. That's one thing, people can have the same name, but what about the passports of the hijackers, which were all found largely undamaged within hours of the attacks, allowing the US government to release their names and likenesses to the media? If the explosions of the planes had been sufficient to incinerate the superstructure of a skyscraper, how did all these paper documents survive the direct impact? Probably a question, maybe they just scanned them in before? I don't know. One of the most troubling and compelling conspiracy theories, although a lot of them just plain aren't compelling at all if you ask me, surround the suggestion that the cell phone calls made from the hijacked planes as desperate passengers tried to console their loved ones with their dying words were fakes. I don't know how compelling this is, frankly. Many scientists and skeptics alike maintain that cell phones would be unable to receive reception at the cruising altitude of a plane. The story has since been altered to suggest that onboard air phones were used, but the more the story shifts and changes, the more skeptical people became. Others have specifically picked out the alarming conversation between Mark Brigham and his mother, in which Brigham says, Mom, this is Mark Brigham. I want you to know that I love you, before later asking, you believe me, don't you? Well, yeah, I guess so, but I mean, you probably would want people to make sure that you knew they knew you weren't joking with a phone call like this. Again, can't say I'm much of a conspiracy theorist. 
The ubiquitous watch phrase of the 9-11 truther movement, which has since become its own meme, is that jet fuel can't melt steel beams. This refers to the theory that some form of other demolition must have been used to take down the Twin Towers, since they believe that the combustion of an aeroplane's fuel would not produce enough heat to warp the steel frame sufficiently for it to collapse. Many believe that a missile attack or a controlled demolition using explosives was actually what was responsible for the collapse of the towers. Some survivors have even claimed that they heard explosions from within the towers as they tried to make an escape. However, a lot of the theories about what can and can't melt steel have since been fairly well debunked. Flight 93, the doomed plane which was reportedly reclaimed by passengers who fought off the hijackers before the plane crashed into a field in Pennsylvania, is another source of conspiracy for the truther movement. These truthers, they sure keep busy. There were no survivors of the crash, which occurred as a direct result of the passengers' heroic actions, but many conspiracy theorists questioned whether or not this is the case. They claimed that it was a US military plane which shot down the plane. And while they don't necessarily disagree with the decision to shoot the plane down, they do question why the government just hasn't admitted it that they did it. Yeah, guys, we might have to have a sit down about all this truth and stuff. Of course, George W. Bush's reading of My Pet Goat to school children is now synonymous with the notion of fiddling while Rome burns. But the then president's younger brother Marvin, who falls under the most suspicion within certain parts of the truther movement. Marvin Bush was a senior executive of a company called Securacom, which was responsible for security at a number of companies and locations across the US, including three of the most important in the 9-11 tale. Dulles International Airport, United Airlines, and of course, the World Trade Center. On the weekend prior to the attacks, there were a series of power downs in the South Tower which were controlled by Securacom, which left the tower without electricity for a day and a half. As a result, there was no security footage and electronic doors were left unlocked, allowing a series of unfamiliar faces to enter and exit the building throughout the 8th and 9th of September. With clients including the US Army, the US Navy and US Air Force and the Department of Justice, Securacom's involvement in Line 11 is seen as some as being a clear indicator of conspiracy to many in the truth of movement. Of course, Marvin Bush is merely a cog in the machine of a much larger theory. It's probably the Illuminati. Let's just cut to the chase. It's probably the big triangle man. The younger Bush's part in events leads many to believe that the horrifying attacks on the United States of September 11, 2001 were perpetrated not by Islamic extremists, not by the Israelis, but by the US government themselves. Those who believe in the notion of an inside job point towards the 1962 Northwoods report as 9-11's blueprint. In the report, the CIA plans for attacks on American and foreign transport targets using bombs and hijackings were revealed. Its original purpose was to pin the blame for an attack on Cuba and called for violent terrorism across the US in order to spark that off. Many point to the perceived beneficiary of the attacks being the US government themselves, allowing them to pursue a controversial patriot act with little to no opposition and position themselves for invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq as part of a war on terror. These suggestions that George W. Bush and powerful influences within the US oil industry orchestrated, or at least allowed, the attacks to happen is the major theory which just won't go away. Could a world leader be willing to allow thousands of their own citizens to die in pursuit of their own agenda? Well, we may never know for sure, but the industrialization of the military complex and the money that's made from repeated wars does lead to some uncomfortable questions about the culture that we perpetuate. <laughs>